So, hi everybody. Um, this is another one of our inspirational chats with um, one of our amazing women in college. Now, as I said before, in, in, if you've watched any of our previous interviews, or this might be the first one you're watching. So, what we wanted to do for Inspirational Women's Week this week is really look at our senior female members of staff to get them to open up and talk a little bit so we know them a little bit more as students and staff. Quite often when you're a senior, senior member of staff, you're a name at the bottom of an email. And certainly for students, they might not know a lot about um, our senior members of staff. So it doesn't get much more senior than the person we're about to speak to. So um, our inspirational, wonderful principal has been kind enough to share some time with us. So thank you so much, Rachel, for giving this with us today. I can't believe when you asked me, I was thinking, I, I don't know, you've got the right person. So no, I appreciate giving the opportunity. Cheers, Louise. Oh, no problem. So first of all, a little bit about your career. Why, why education? Oh, I tell you, well, I'll be honest with you. I'm from a family of nurses. So my mum was a nurse, my nan was a nurse, and um, my uncle Mal was a, was a nurse as well. So I think everyone expected me to go into the nursing pr profession, but what became abundantly clear was that, that wasn't for me in any way, shape or form, because I had a little bit of a problem with blood. Uh, so then I, I was massively into sport. So I just loved playing sport. It was the thing, you know, I wouldn't come home till about half past six at night because we'd stayed in school and sports or just playing hockey or whatever it was. And I had the best teacher in the world and her name was Penny Beard. And she just made me realise that I wanted to be a PE teacher. And so she said that when she went to university, she went to Iron Marsh, it was fantastic. And so I thought, right, I'll, I'll have a little bit of that. So being honest, if I'm, if I'm being totally honest and transparent, and this doesn't mean that everybody should do this, I wasn't the best in school. So I... Uh, I really loved sport, but didn't love much of else, to be honest. Uh, but the problem was, is I needed particular things like English and maths in order to get to university to be a teacher. So I failed my GCSE English first and foremost, the first time. So then I had to reset that. And then I did my A-levels in secondary school and I failed them. And then I thought, oh, God, I've got to get to university. Apparently, it's amazing. So I came to Uber College and I did two A-levels in a year. I went to Iron Marsh, which is John Moore's, and then just became a teacher. So that's what, that's why education. Um, do you want to tell you where I went then? Yeah, because your your career is quite interesting because it's quite there's diversity within your career, isn't there? From yeah. the different areas in which you've been a, a part of. Yeah. So I um, when I graduated from university, I my first job was in a pupil referral unit in the middle of Birkenhead. It was called Kilgore, and I would say it is probably really, truly where I learnt my craft. There was very little that, you know, was thrown at you, literally thrown at you at times that, you, you know, you didn't have to deal with in some way, shape or form. Um, and I just picked up so much experience, so much knowledge of how to make sure challenging situations pre were preempted so they didn't even stop. Then when they did arise, that we were able to, to tackle them and deal with them. And then I took a total flip and then went to work in an all-girls Catholic school, St. Julie's. Where again, I learned about standards. And if I'm being honest again, I my first year there, I, I don't think they thought I was the best person in the whole wide world. I was still enjoying life outside of outside of work. You know, I wasn't necessarily in desperately early. So I had my very first uh, probation. And my head of the department at the time, who I absolutely adore, and she adores me, or adored me anyway, said to me, what do you think your skills are? I said, I don't know. What do you think they are? And she said, I can't think of them. I don't think you've got, I'm not quite sure. And I thought, Oh my God, she really doesn't think I'm any good. So then I made it my life's mission to make sure she thought I was the best thing since sliced bread. And I left that role probably four or five years later and she was upset and I was upset. And it was just a little bit of a, a lit fire for me to be able to be as good as I possibly can. Then I went into post-16 education. So I lived in Liverpool all the time, but travelled to Blackpool, where I was a head of department there. And then from Blackpool, I went to be a curriculum area manager in a sixth form in an FE college in Blackburn. So we still lived in Liverpool, did the travel. And then I was fortunate enough to get a vice principal job at Calderdale College, which was Halifax. Still lived in Liverpool, did the journey. Um, but I've worked with some amazing people. So that's why I've stayed in education. I just, and I love, if you give me a choice of working in secondary school or working in that post 16, so colleges, colleges for me day in, day out. It's exactly why 
it's exactly why I'm in education. And that is just to make sure students get the best skills to get better jobs and have better lives, 100%. It sounds really, oh, but it's the truth. It is the truth. I think it's, I think if we don't have that, especially in the mm -hmm. FE sector, if you yeah. don't have that, that no. I want to make it transform and inspire. Yeah. You don't have that. Yeah. That's that's like the tool. I always talk about tool bags. That's yeah. what you need in your tool bag for to work in FA. What what made you want to keep your boots in Liverpool? Did what was that importance about have not someone from like Halifax? I'm gonna get a house in Halifax or uh, I well I'm not quite sure. I'm sure you know, but for everybody who, who could be watching this, I'm from Bootle, born and bred, something I'm very, very proud of. I grew up at the back of Mons on Cambridge Road. Um just had some amazing times there at Liverpool. It's really hard to explain unless you're from Liverpool. And people might look at you and go, oh, whatever. It, it feels like when you talk about it, it feels like something that comes from deep within you. It sounds really silly, doesn't it? But deep within you. And and I've always had an allegiance to Liverpool. I've always had an allegiance to, to Bootle. Um, my mum, if I ever moved out to Liverpool, she would hunt me down. So I think the furthest I ever moved was to Allerton. Uh, and then my mum followed me probably about four years later. So if I'd if I'd moved from Liverpool to Blackpool, she wouldn't have been best pleased. So there was there was an element of uh, I can't let her down. I need to be around. And also my dad died when we were really young, and so we're quite a close close knit family. She's done a lot for me, and there's no way I could just move to a couple of hours away. But for me, there's no place I'd rather be. I've, I've moved out. I've got a postcode now that doesn't have an L in front of it. And then, oh no, phone number that doesn't have an 0151 in front of it. And that hurts me heart. I'm thinking, oh my, that sounds silly. But when I got the, the landline, I was thinking, <gasps> so. I only pulled that funny face there because Rachel's moved to where I was brought up. Yeah, and I, yeah, it was the phone still, it was still, I, I used to argue, I like, you know, because it was weirdly enough, it's still, you know, when you, you still want to be, when you live in that particular area, you yeah. still want to go, yeah, well, I'm from Liverpool and yeah. people argue all day long that you're not from Liverpool. Yeah. Uh, but there's still an L in front of it. Um, one thing, sorry, Louise, the one thing I will say as well, I haven't come back to the college, obviously this is where I went, and you look out the window and you see the sea over there, there's, there's just a massive affinity to the Mersey. It's like, this is the best office that I could ever... And, you know, you've got all the ports and it is very industrial, but, God, it's just fantastic to look at everything. The view look at. is amazing, yeah. isn't it? I, a little bit, I think. Yeah, I quite often will take a moment on the 5th, 6th or 7th just to... Mm -hmm. I think we always appreciate what, what's outside outside the window. Yeah. You came, so you came to Hubert College. What What's changed? What's <laughs> <laughs> changed? That's a tough one. Um, well, this is going to sound really bad now, but not much actually. Not yeah. a lot has changed. We, we've got some build. The, so, for example, Balliol. I did my A levels in the PAL Centre, so the Port Academy. It was called Pembroke. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's where A levels were at that time. But you used to come here because it's where the sports hall was and stuff like that. This building, Balliol, has hardly changed. I'd say the reception's changed a little bit. There's a little bit of change um, in, in some of the floors. And I'd say PAL hasn't really changed apart from changing its name. And obviously, there's probably more construction in there. I was here for a year. And so it wasn't that long. And I, I sound like a really bad student. The first couple of months were a bit rocky because I was I was working in a pub, which was ridiculous hours. And I was coming here and then trying to fit everything in. But no, I wouldn't say much has changed. I'd say, I'd say the feeling that I go. For people who don't know, I've been here just over a year and I started three weeks just before we went into lockdown. And I do say in the emails when I send them out to staff and, and, and people who I work with, I can't thank you enough for all your support. I'd say the 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 passion, the values of the college is is the exact same as it as it was then from a personnel point of view. So from the way the people are, from the way the staff are, and actually it's less about a Hubert College thing and it's more probably about this locality that makes people the way they are. So so very little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just a couple of room changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, what has been your biggest challenge in, in your career so far? <laughs> Which is a bit tricky because we've just been through principal and the go. You've just been a principal yeah, through COVID. Uh, there's probably a, a few things that have, have tipped in from being challenging for a variety of reasons. So I'd say probably one challenge that i have faced is i had a really i was really i had a really good land manager in, in a college that i worked in unfortunately 
in the space of two months, she just passed away. And that absolutely, she was, she was exactly how you wanted to be. You know, she had a happy balance of firmness, high expectations, but you could have a laugh with her as well. And so within two months that she unfortunately taken ill and passed away. And that absolutely, I was just starting to find myself in my career and she was my line manager. And I just, yeah, that, that was really challenging. And it was probably at a time, if I'm being honest, where I didn't necessarily align to the college's values. They, they were different than mine. And I think that's one thing that I've learned in my career, that I've never worked in a college that has different values or morals to me. I think that makes it really difficult. So you, if you're operating in an environment or you're working in, a, in an environment where you see things happen and you feel uncomfortable with that, then that's not the organisation for you and that's not the college for you. And it was probably all of that coincided at the same time. That, that was a challenge. Um, I definitely say a challenge has been this year. It's been the most, um, I've all, for at least 18 months before I got the job, I wanted to be a principal. And I only wanted to be the principal of one or two places, and this was one. Um, I'd say it's been a hard year, definitely. And more, I would say it's been more challenging. I think we've got through it remarkably well, to be honest, but that's because of the strength of the team. But it's probably more challenging because it's, I haven't been the principal I expected to be. You know, that that person who's just constantly walking the floors. Because I, I may, if I've been walking these floors over the last 12 months, no one's been me and I'd look a bit odd, if I'm being honest. So no, I'd say that's definitely been a challenge. Um, probably another challenge that, you know, we're talking about um, le leadership and women in, 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 in leadership and inspirational women mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I'd say one of, one of the biggest challenges that still exists is for you to, what did they say on RuPaul, get outside your own head? And so sometimes yeah. you you in a room, I'd say a big challenge that I'm overcoming now and far better being in a room and, and thinking that what you've got to say is not important. That's probably something that plagued the original part of my career, especially when that room is dominated pe by people who don't sound like you a lot of the time and yeah. don't necessarily look like you. And so you, you find yourself doing this. This is the biggest challenge. I've, I, I, I'm over it now. But in my earlier days of my career, you'd find yourself going, saying before you said anything, this might sound stupid. And actually, yeah. it doesn't sound stupid at all, but you're preempting what you're about to say when actually what you've got to say is just as valid as anything else. So, so a variety of challenges, emotional challenge, you know, challenges particularly in relation to the pandemic, but also that mindset is a challenge. I'd say there's, there's been a number of challenges, but I've had a, yeah, it's not over yet. Well, I feel like it needs to be over, but I've had a great career so far for me. That's really insightful because, and, and I do think as, as women, for some unknown reason, uh, that internal saboteur is mm -hmm. always, always there. Yeah. So Rachel won't mind me saying, she said at the beginning of the interview, the three women that we have interviewed all been so successful within careers and done so much, all said, why? Why have you chosen me? Yeah, exactly. Why? Yeah. I'm not I'm yeah. not inspirational. You're thinking, are you having a laugh? You're the principal yeah. of the college, of course you are. Um, so, it, yeah, internal saboteurs as women, I think it, it just yeah. stays forever. Yeah. Um, I think, sorry, Louise, that's, I think there's two what? things that couples with that as well. It is the it is the woman thing, definitely. It's a it's a female thing. But I've been so lucky to work with some amazing women, as in, yeah, to demonstrate to me about you know how you should operate and you should be confident. And I've been, but also as well, I've been, I've been, I've had a my last line manager. He was a he was a you know he was a man. He was amazing. He. He provided every opportunity for me to really, really flourish. And I wouldn't be sat here if it wasn't for him as an individual. So it is the female thing. But I do think it's also as well, and I hate saying this, it's the Liverpool thing as well. So when you say, I don't want to sound stupid, I've spent a lot of my career surrounded by people who have not had my accent in any way, shape or form. And sometimes I think we believe that those people with the best ideas and the most inspirational people usually sound not northern or, they, you know, they sound Southern or they sound posher, as you would call it. And I'd probably say it's only the last five to six years that I've I've got outside of my own head in relation to that. I'm extremely proud of how I sound, extremely proud. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm definitely not so now, but I was brought, where I was brought up, I was I was always deemed as being accentless. So I didn't, people would say, where are you from? Because I didn't have a really strong Liverpool accent, but you yeah. could tell I was, no one could kind of define where I was from. And when I first started teaching here, which was 17 years ago, I started teaching at the college. Um, the students used to say, you're dead posh. 
and you must really know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm not Deb Posh, and I really don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I think as as I've lived in the area I live in now, my accent's slightly changed. Mm. And then when I've had the opportunity to go to London, because uh, I'm with being staff governor, I go there quite a lot, and with this work that I do, um, student engagement leads, I'm fortunate to do a lot of work there. And straight away, I feel like if I'm surrounded by a group of people that are from London, all of a sudden I click into that. Oh, I'm a scouser and I need to apologize for what I'm saying. And, and it, it, it's strange work. So I'm here and I'm really posh. And in London, I'm really scouse. But I, <laughs> I, I do feel yeah. like a, you know, straight away I go, oh, the scout, you know, and those jokes, oh, scousers in the room. And you just think, yeah. oh, I love, I love it. Yeah. Because yeah. I'll prove you wrong by the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. I, do, I think it, I think it, it does it does definitely drive on but it's interesting what that, that student said to you about you know you, you're dead posh and you clearly know a lot and i think in society what we do less so now but we've been more guilty of aligning knowledge skills amazing people with that certain accent and i think what you're seeing now is more people in those higher positions who don't sound like they're on the BBC News. They sound like you grew up with them five minutes ago, and I think that's amazing. So it is a little bit the biggest daunting thing. I've, I've never really felt about the female thing, the, male, the woman thing too much, but definitely the I don't sound like I should type of thing. Last question. Okay. What inspires you and who inspires you? I don't know, I think it's really difficult to distinguish what and who. If I start off with who, I, I would most definitely say the people in my life inspire me, and there's so many of them. You know, I've got an amazing wife, my mum, my nan. I talk about my mum and nan all the time, and I talk about my wife all the time as well. They just, when I think about my mum, my dad died when I was nine. And her and my nan more or less brought, me, brought us both up. And, you know, I say, we've turned out all right. And, and and I think just watching them go through, I think about it now. If you lose someone, if you lose your, your husband or your wife when you're 38, how can you then, I don't know whether I'd have the strength to go forward and be able to deal with that. And so as a consequence, I'm, you know, definitely those people inspire me. Again, I'd probably say I've worked with, for really inspirational women, women who are all totally different from really stern to not really stern to, you know, flying by the seat of the pants to really structured. And I've, I've been a little bit like a magpie and tried to steal all the best bits of every single one of them. So I have had, I've been fortunate enough to have some really, really inspirational people um, within my life throughout my career. And like I say, John, I used to work for, he's been amazing. So I've been very, very fortunate. What I think probably just just probably what we do here inspires me. I think we have the opportunity here. I always say whenever I'm dealing with employers or working with anyone, we have one sole goal, and that is a student comes in and we teach them something they didn't know that will help them get a better life. And that better life for some people might mean a better job, a better car, a better house, take the family on holiday. And I think when I witness that activity across this college, that's probably what inspires me. And that's, in reality, it's like we touched upon before, that is exactly why we do it. So, yeah, it's that. But lots of people inspire me. Yeah. None of which are really, it's weird, because you think about people inspiring, you think it'd be someone like, I don't know, someone famous on the telly or someone who's, you know, given a, a motivational speech or stuff like that. But actually, most of the people who inspire me are the ones who have been closest to me, definitely. I can relate to that. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much. Right, it's been my time. It means so much to well, it means so much to me. But really, do, I think it's brilliant that we've had this opportunity for our Inspirational Women's Week to uh, mm -hmm. speak to our, I say, senior. Couldn't get more senior than Rachel. Oh, yeah. uh, female members of staff <laughs> who uh, have given us a little insight into them as people. So thank you so much for your time, awesome. Rachel. Thanks for asking me. Really good to talk to you. All right, take care. And you. Thank you.